from the Green Emerald Isles of Ireland to the majestic beauty of southern Utah came my heritage, my great-grandfather knew personally the prophet Joseph Smith, and he witnessed the terrible sorrow as the prophet and his dead brother was brought into Nauvoo. He crossed the plains with his wife, gave birth to their first baby in the plains of Iowa. His last baby was born in Canaraville, a little girl who didn't live to be one year old. And so my heritage uh, came when I was born into the Pollock family. In later life, I can do the sequences. I was born as a child and lived in the little town of Tropic. I became a sheep herder very young in life, and I worked with cattle later on in life. After I left the sheep herd, I went to work uh, as an entertainer and a horse wrangler for Reuben Sard at Ruby's Inn and took the tourists down into the beautiful cathedrals and castles of Bryce Canyon National Park. This was a wonderful growing experience. I used to lecture at Ruby's Inn back in the 30s and entertain in, in the night. Wintertime, I'd work in the, in the sawmill and, and uh, I stayed there until the Second World War came and then I moved from there with my family into Ogden and worked at Second Street Depot as a dispatcher of the government freight to the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific Railroad in those days called OURD in Ogden. After the war, I came back to Tropic and Montora and I began to build a home and to raise our family and in the Tropic and I had to hunt work in several places. 1949, I went to work for the Utah Parks Company in the national parks and stayed there for 27 years. The Union Pacific Railroad finally turned their uh, holdings in the national parks and their franchises over to uh, the airplane people who run it to this very day, and uh, they decided in their office in Chicago that they would uh, fire or turn loose, get rid of anybody that was over 60 years old, and at that time I was over 60 years old, and uh, so I found myself without a job, and uh, began to think about retirement and uh, so when I got 62 years old I, I retired and got on Social Security and uh, began to hunt work wherever I could at this uh, shortly after this the SART people uh, they begin to expand and do a lot of building and uh, I went to work for them and worked uh, uh, a lot building motels, restaurants, swimming holes, and uh, campgrounds, worked uh, for the SART people for many years. Then I worked myself into my own occupation of taking care of big tours. And all the time I was working for SARTs, I was lecturing at night and meeting the tourist world and uh, this was very wonderful. Doorbell and I got called on a mission. This was back in 75, 1875, I mean 1975, and we went to Indiana. That's where our mission call was, and uh, when we got in Indiana, why we went to the mission headquarters, which is in Cornell, Indiana, north of uh, Indianapolis, got snowed in, and when the snow got so we could barely travel, 
the mission president sent us into the northern part of Indiana, almost up to the, well, in fact, is right up to the border where you go into Michigan and to Ohio on the east. And there we stayed a winter time in a big foundry city called Kendallville. And we were not too far from other very large cities to the south of us was Fort Wayne and Gary, Indiana, and uh, large cities to the north of us, many colleges around us, great basketball country, cold winters, but the people were colder than the winters. And it was quite a growing experience there. Then Torbell got seriously ill. The doctors in the hospital in Kendallville couldn't diagnose it. And after several prayers and blessing Torbell, we decided we'd better bring her to the LDS hospital in Salt Lake. So we flew in a plane from Fort Wayne to Chicago, from there to Salt Lake City. And then as soon as I could, I Gary Don and I uh, got on the plane and flew back to Fort Wayne, and missionaries picked us up and took us to uh, Kendallville, where I picked my car up, and we drove from there. Uh, we left at the, in the early wee hours of the morning and drove to South Chicago, crossed Iowa into Nebraska, then we turned up into the North Dakota and went to South Dakota and stayed in the edge of Wyoming that night. Next day we went over uh, Bighorn Mountain and uh, down into Graybull and stayed with Lyle a night and then the next night we headed home because I was in a hurry to get back to the, see how Zorabelle was doing. And she had a very sick spell but she got over it as she always does. She always bounces back. And then uh, I begin to work with the tourists and get on the large buses and uh, to stay with them to the national parks and to entertain them at night. And uh, I begin to find a talent that I guess I was born with. It was to write and to uh, get my, not only my historical part of my life, but the role, the, uh, the uh, beauty of my life in my own expressive words and uh, tried to describe Mother Nature in my best eloquence and try to bring out the honest truth of geology and archaeology and to correlate the uh, history of our earth as it should be with the scriptures. And uh, I want to bear testimony to uh, my ancestors and to my progenitors and to those who will come after me that this earth does not have any antiquity. It was made by God for his spiritual children to have a chance to have free agency to choose between good and evil. It was never meant to have antiquity. It was made out of reorganized matter which embraces and uh, uh, brings about the fossils in true perspective because when this earth was born, the fossils was in the elements. The elements was needed to bring about the fossilization, both plant and animal, to bring about the oil that we enjoy in this great mechanical age of the airplane and the automobile and the train and etc. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the formative years that I worked in the national parks, most of that time was in Grand Canyon. In winter times, I spent a lot of time uh, at Bryce Canyon National Park. In winter time, when we couldn't ha handle the tourists while we were working to maintain, I'd done lots of painting for the Utah Parks Company, both Bryce shingling, other kind of carpenter work, and then I got to be the foreman down in the bottom of Gr uh, Grand Canyon, running the power plant down there, furnishing electricity and water for the North Rim, and. Uh, Met uh, many wonderful people down there. Zora Bell went down with me for about eight summers. And uh, we had our family down there and bought employment for my boys so they could help me put them through college. 
Gail started out, and each one of my boys took their turns down in Grand Canyon. How we did love it down there. Our white house had uh, three bedrooms, a dining room and living room combined, an electric kitchen and, and a storeroom and a washroom, two bathrooms, and a big 50-foot veranda porch. And uh, it was very nice to live down there. And uh, Bright Angel Creek flowed right by the powerhouse. And while we were down in there, many, many things happened. Had tragedies, and we had uh, uh, experiences that were very, very beautiful and spiritual. Met uh, many, many lovely people. Prepared a few for baptism. Well, I remember two different boys. One boy came in down to Phantom Ranch and got a job dishwashing. He was smoking and drinking heavy. And met two Mormon girls, and they brought him up to our place. And eventually, we got him to read in the Book of Mormon and got him through smoking. And he joined the church and went on a mission in Bolivia, South America. Another boy came down in there on a survival from California and cut himself and had to come to me for help. And we got him and finally got him interested in the church, and he joined the church and married a waitress that was working up on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Many wonderful things happened down there spiritually, and uh, while we were in Grand Canyon, the kids learned how to fish. And I guess they're about the best stream fishers in the country, and they still love this beautiful sport of going to the streams and fishing. Although we do, in our later lives, we've then got a boat and we've done quite a lot of fishing in the Colorado River and on the lakes of Wyoming and Utah. And we enjoy fishing as a family. It's a very wonderful feeling to get out on the water. That especially did we have many, many experiences fishing down in the Grand Canyon. Some of them were quite exciting. I remember one time I come back from work and Jeff was about oh, 11 or 12 years old, and he wanted to go fishing. So we got some angle worms and we got our fishing poles and down the creek we went, because down the creek we had a chance of catching some big ones. There's spawners that come up from Lake Mead. And the we'd had a terrible flood and it almost washed the trail out and it was just barely, just barely wide enough for us to walk on. And I was in lead, and Jeff was right behind me, and I just come to an abrupt halt because I saw a rattlesnake curled up right on the trail. And Jeff bumped into me, and I said, a rattlesnake. He peeked around me, and, he, and uh, I said, well, I believe it's two. They were mating. And so we stepped back. If I'd have took another step, I'd have stepped right in the middle of them. We took a step back, and I grabbed a big rock. There was all kinds of rocks on the side hill there, and I threw as hard as I could and killed one of them. The other one went down a hole. It was right by a hole in the cliff. And we come back later on and got the other one, and uh, Lyle and I went fishing one morning, and uh, we were coming down what they call the penstock. This was about a 30-inch wood pipe where we had took the water down to the... Uh, light plant where the water turned the wheels and caused it, made the generation in the, and we had a little hydroelectric plant there to furnish the electricity for the north rim and to pump the water up over the mountain. And uh, Lyle and I was coming down along this one time and all at once, he was in lead and all at once I seen him turn and just almost fly in the air and uh, bumped into me and knocked me down and there was a rattlesnake. He almost stepped on it, and, and uh, but we we had th things like this all the time. I got a letter from a New York Zoo, the National Park Service sent it down, said, Herm, please uh, catch a, a rattlesnake. It had to be a certain kind, what they call the Grand Canyon rattlesnake, with pink sides and yellow stomach. Very classical rattlesnake. I was coming from the pump house one day, and a great big one was curled up in the shade of a cedar tree right on the trail, and I had to detour around him, but I got a big stick, herded him down, and he went into a, under a rock, 
And so I piled other rocks so he couldn't get out. And then I come back down, got Zorbell and Jeff, and we went up and and uh, I had a five-gallon can that the Park Service had sent down with the screen riveted on one side so he could see in it. And then I got this rattlesnake. I got him out from under the rock and let him crawl in the hole in the five-gallon can. And then I screwed the lid on and I phoned the Park Service that. Uh, I had a rattlesnake. Well, they was coming down the next day, and the evening before that, Jeff wanted to go fishing again. So we went up, and a little rainstorm come up, and, and we had a lot of old rotten penstock boards uh, where we tore them out and piled them in a pile, and they deteriorated, and there was lots of angleworms. I said, well, we'd go up and get some, some uh, angleworms, and... Uh, there's a big rock there come down and split, come way off on the top of the rim of the Grand Canyon, a terrible big rock. started to rain, and so we crawled up on this rock, and there was some loose rocks there that eroded away, and Jeff picked one up, and the big scar pin was on the lower side of it, but he didn't see it, and he throwed it, and the scar pin came off, and I was sitting on this big rock, and that scar pin came down and lit right in the V in my shirt, right under my chin. Lit right, I was kind of leaning back, and it lit right on me. And I just froze, and it began to crawl, and and it didn't crawl towards my face, it started to crawl the other way, and I give you know, Jeff a scotch blessing. We uh, went down, moved a few boards, and as we moved a few boards, a great big gray rat ran out and the beavers had been cutting the willows there and I picked up about a six inch beaver cutting and throwed it as hard as I could at that rat and hit it right in the back. And when we got some angle worms, well, we took this rat down and poked it down the hole into this rattlesnake. Then we went down fishing and the next morning when we got up, we went out to look at the rattlesnake and it swallowed this rat and it had a great big old bulge in its stomach. And uh, another time I caught a, a black and white uh, king snake and so we put it in the in the snake cage and I caught a big lizard and we had a boy that used to come and visit us quite a lot a geologist from uh, Flagstaff and all at once we heard a commotion in the cage and we looked and this king snake had unhinged its jaws and it had this big lizard with its its mouth right over the mouth of the of the lizard. So we all got down on our stomach and laid there on the floor and watched the king snake completely swallow this great big lizard, which was quite a lot bigger in, in circumference than the snake's body, and it had a big hump in it. And uh, I saw down in there, Mama. Uh, Scarpin packing her young on her body, and uh, I saw the triangular wasp bury, uh, uh, I mean, the wasp buried the triangular and lay their eggs in it. It was a growing experience, a very, very wonderful experience. Jeff and I both got stung by scorpions down in there, but we never did get uh, bit by any snakes, none of our family. Wonder we didn't, but we didn't. We were very watchful. And we found lots of Cliff Dweller homes and took lots of pictures and the kids come down and we used to go to Ribbon Falls and what joy we'd have down there. And these were growing years in the National Park. Then came the time when I decided that I would just entertain the tourists. And so in the year of 1984, I, uh, 8, 1983 I should say, I lectured 160 times at Ruby's Inn, and uh, I get on the big buses and escort them through Zions Canyon and Bryce Canyon. Sometimes I meet them down to the Thunderbird, the big motel in St. George, take them to Brigham Young's home, and they introduce the gospel to them there in the tabernacle in St. George, and then go to the temple and show them two pictures. The morning breaks with the low Thomas narrating the tabernacle choir and the ruins of South America and ancient America, a great film on the Book of Mormon. Then I take them through Zion's Canyon, Cedar Breaks, and Bryce Canyon National Park. And then I have 
lots of times I take private tours into Circle Cliff and over into Capitol Reef country, down into the Priya River drainage, and, and uh, this has been a real interesting part of my life is to entertain the tourist. I have uh, learned to make my own tunes to, and write my own songs, and the tourists seem to like them better than other songs that I sing. And uh, I've had lots of experiences uh, with the tourists, and uh, it's uh, now February the 15th in uh, 1984, just recently the NBC telev uh, television people come down and interviewed me at Ruby's Inn and gave me about eight minutes of their time while I told them history of Bryce Canyon. National Park and uh, my work in the southern part of the state. But the southern part of the state has become a museum. And I guess the deepest dedication that I can give to myself and to the world is my testimony, and I can only do that by sitting down to the typewriter and bringing the beautiful sculpture of truth. I take the great deceptions these great mortal chapters of the uh, arm of the flesh tear them down and re-sculpture them into the facets of truth because correlating with the truth is where I'm happy. I took Zora Bell and Lyle and uh, Gail down to Tucson, Arizona to meet a dear friend, Sister Dodge, and we blessed her home. And this Sister Dodge I'd met at Bryce Canyon in one of my lectures, and we become vast friends, and she wanted us to come down and bless her home. She's getting old and decrepit way in her high 80s. And when she passed away, uh, why, she willed me her library, and that was a nice gesture. But uh, while we were down in that country, I took uh, G G Gail and... Uh, Lyle to the museum there in Tucson, Arizona, and showed them the elephants that had been dug up with arrowheads and the unarticulated bones, proving beyond a shadow of doubt that man was here before any animal. And I want to bear testimony to my children and to my grandchildren that Adam, Father Adam, was the first flesh upon this earth. He wasn't the first fossil, he was the first flesh. And his wife Eve was the second flesh, and then all animals, insects, fowls, and everything else was placed on the earth because Adam and Eve was put here to subdue them and to name them and to classify them. And that's how life began on this earth. Now, in the earth it was fossils, and they were fossils of other planets. This planet will be destroyed, and fossils are being made, covered up in the, ball, the bottom of the seas and in the rivers, and there'll be fossils made on this earth. And when this, the elements of this earth is reused in another planet, there'll be the fossils on that planet. This is a continuum operation. Continuity of eternity is something that man has never grasped. There's no beginning, and there can't be an end. If there was, they wouldn't be eternity. And uh, another thing that I've enjoyed so much is to find symbolisms. All the beautiful symbolism left by the ancient people and the sequences. Adam's life and his children for about a thousand years was on one great continent of land. There was only one big body of water and only one continent of land when Adam and Eve were placed on this earth in the Garden of Eden, and then after they partook of the forbidden fruit and become mortal again so they could have children, they changed from immortality to mortality so they could have children again. And then they could go any place on the face of the land. There never was a barren strait. There never was a need of a barren strait. Early man could go as far north, south, east, and west as he wanted to, from shore to shore. 
And he walked and he talked and he herded and he killed and he lived off in the extinct animal as well as the animals we have on the earth because man and animal was contemporary from the very beginning of this mortal creation. Then the great flood came and in the 101 years after the flood, the people being so wicked, God chastised them again and broke up the continent of land into the continental drift that we know today, the islands of the sea and the great continent, scattered the people on them, and a Jaredite people came here to America, which was at that time pronounced by God and Jesus Christ as a promised land, and they peopled it. And they became a wicked, slothful people, and they perished. And then the American Indian forefathers, the Nephite, Lamanites, came, and they uh, finally annihilated the Nephite faction, and the Lamanite was called American Indians by the first uh, uh, people who found America, such as Columbus, Americans, Vasquez, and many others, Cortez, later on, and uh, the American Indian name, but they are strictly Israelites or Nephite Lamanites. And so we, as the Gentiles or the Caucasian people from after 1492, around uh, by uh, 1776, why we became a new people, the fourth culture of the United States and America. And uh, then the dispensation of time came in with Joseph Smith, the last one. And uh, now all that wickedness has destroyed upon this earth, such as the great division of the land in Peleg's time, that's in the tenth chapter of, the, of the Genesis. All of it has to go back to its original status. Uh, in the very near future, there will only be one body of land and one body of water. And the center stake of Zion, or the New Jerusalem, will be in Jackson County, Missouri. And uh, the most colossal history is yet in the future. That in my later life, during the war, I dispatched it, uh, freight to the armed services from 2nd Street Depot. That was a great learning experience. Had many, many things happen there. I remember one day in Ogden, the governor came to me, I mean the general, general of the army, over that depot came and he said, Herm, what you doing tomorrow? And I said, oh, just dispatching trains. He said, no, you're not. You're going to go with me. He said, your understudy will have to carry on till I can get you back. Took me to Bush Bushnell Hospital. That was an amputee hospital in Brigham City, Utah, tremendous hospital. I went and worked with the Red Cross, and I went with Lila Peterson, a very accomplished pianist. Uh, she'd been to the Conservatory of Music in Chicago, and she was really a genius on the piano. And we play, I played the guitar, and she'd play the piano, and they let the uh, sick soldiers, amputee soldiers, uh, sing or talk or do anything we could. We went there just to help them with the general. and. Uh, there I met Elvin Sedwicks. I went into a room and there was Elvin Sedwicks with both legs healing, then both of them amputated. They were blowed off in tank explosion in the World War, Second World War. And uh, that was an experience I can never forget. I was asked by the state president to go out to the reform school there in Ogden and talk one Sunday, and that was a growing experience growing experience to go up to D Memorial Hospital and bless the sick. It's the first time in my life that I laid my hands under a oxygen tent and blessed a, a lady who gave birth to a baby to try to wring her uh, serenity and calm her feelings with my love and understanding in the priesthood. All these growing experiences. Got my patriarchal blessing in Ogden by Judge Roberts. We talked for about an hour waiting for the scribe to come. We thought I thought sure he'd uh, tell me to go out with my dreams at that time to become a geologist and a mining engineer and get wealthy. And when he laid his hands on my head, the very first thing he said, don't do it or it'll destroy your life. Well, I took that to heart and I changed my whole attitude. I began, instead of looking for the jewels in the earth crust, the gold and the silver and the rubies and the diamonds and the and the precious jewels, I began to look for the truths, the memory gems, 
the beauty of Mother Nature, and I found much more richer things in my life because that is where I have found a deep abiding trust and love for Mother Nature in her jewels, in her great museum of time is where I have found the deepest happiness and the deepest serenity and solitude of my whole life. When I go out on Mother Nature's breast and to this very day, though I'm almost 74 years old, I can forget all of the world, the cares of the world, because in my later life, nature is still my constant companion. My family.